Our sermon text for this morning comes from the book of Revelation. This morning we're reading from the second chapter, reading verses 1 through 7, and then continuing in the third chapter, verses 19 through 22. I invite you to read along in your pew Bible on page 991, or if you have your own Bible with you. Um, if you have your Bible app on your phone, feel free to pull that out, or if you just like to listen. Uh, but let us attend to God's word for us this morning. Jesus said, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And continuing in chapter 3. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Do you please pray with me? Holy Spirit, descend upon us that we may indeed hear what you speak to us this morning. Filter out any words from my mouth that are not from you and work in our hearts and minds that what is from you might uh, enrich us and help us to follow you and to proclaim your love to the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as you um, are probably aware by now, if you weren't beforehand, we had vacation Bible school this last week. Right? We spent the week in Babylon with Daniel, uh, with lions, with, with hanging gardens, um, with all kinds of, of just wonderful games and activities and stories. Um, and one of the things we learned is that it was a difficult time to be the people of God. It was a hard thing for, for Daniel and Daniel's friends to follow God. They were challenged to do so there in Babylon. It was a difficult time for God's people, and that's the same thing that was going on in this book of Revelation. We talked a few uh, weeks ago about how when this book was written, it was written to churches who were struggling. The church was being persecuted. People were afraid to admit that they followed Jesus because they could be thrown in jail, they could be killed. It can be challenging to be God's people. And so God gave to John this vision that we know as the book of Revelation. And last week, we looked at the last part of the first chapter where John uh, has this vision of Jesus, right? this vision of Jesus that is powerful and perhaps even a little disconcerting, where, where he sees Jesus as, as one like a son of man standing among seven lampstands, and he has the seven stars in his hands, and he has eyes like blazing fire, and he has feet like bronze like bronze in a furnace. 
And he has this sword coming out of his mouth, this sharp double-edged sword. We have this, this vision of Jesus, and we talked about some of what that means. But then after that vision, Jesus says to John, write, write this to these seven churches. Jesus stands among seven lampstands, and he has John write to seven churches. And that seven is not accidental. Seven throughout Scripture is a number that indicates fulfillment or completion, fullness. There are seven, seven lamps on a menorah. Right? There are seven days of creation. And there are seven churches that John writes to here. And in fact, if you read in the rest of the letters in the New Testament, guess how many churches Paul wrote to? Seven. Yeah, okay. Because seven represents a fullness. Okay? We have these letters being written to the churches, but it's this indication that it's not just to that one church. It's to the whole church, to the universal church. Okay? That is why at the end of each of these letters... We read, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, plural. Okay. It's written to one, but it's written for all. Okay. And it takes that, this abundance of churches to fully grasp what it is that God is trying to tell us. Okay. If you read through these letters to the churches, the one we read uh, this morning, where he's writing to the church in Ephesus, Jesus leads off with, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. And we recognize that as part of the vision that John just had of Jesus. And then to the next church, he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. And again, we recognize that from, from this vision of Jesus that was given to John. To each church, Jesus describes himself with a little different uh, words, different aspects of what was revealed to John in that vision. Okay. And I think Jesus is trying to tell us that guess what? Okay. You Presbyterians, okay. you don't have it all. Okay. You Catholics, no, you, you've got only part of the vision. Okay. You Orthodox, same thing. Okay. He writes to the seven churches and each church gives a different perspective, a different aspect of the full vision of Jesus because we need one another to see who Jesus is. Okay? The full picture of who Jesus is isn't something that any congregation, any denomination, any tradition, okay, any church in any part of the world can fully grasp. Okay? And so we come together as the universal church to get a better perspective of who this Jesus is. And it's a reminder that, that any one congregation, we shouldn't try to be all things to all people. Okay? That's not what Jesus calls us to do. He gives a different perspective, a different part of who he is to each, each church so that as we come together, we have a fuller understanding of who he is. Okay? These letters are written to the, to the universal church. They're written to all of us. Okay? But they're not generic. Okay? Jesus is writing to each church specifically. Okay. Notice what he says at the beginning there, verse 2 in the, uh, of what we just read. He says, I know your deeds. Okay. Church in Ephesus, I know. I know your deeds. To the church in Smyrna, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. To the church in Pergamum, he says, I know where you live. Okay. Jesus is saying every church every congregation, every individual, okay, we have our own, our own context. Okay? We're not all the same. Okay? You can't give the same message to everybody and have it work. Okay? We, as, as the Presbyterian Church in Harbor Springs, okay, Jesus knows us specifically, just as he knows our, our sister congregations. He knows Main Street Baptist. He knows those people. He knows the Methodists. He knows the churches in Petoskey and downstate and throughout the nation and throughout the world. Okay? He knows them specifically for who they are. Okay? Jesus is speaking to us all, but he also speaks to us individually. 
and he speaks what we need to hear. And as Jesus speaks to the church then, and speaks what we need to hear, he doesn't give us some generic advice where you can just go pick up a, a book at, at Barnes and Nobles and find out, oh, this is how you do church, okay? He says, no, it doesn't work that way. Here's what you need. Okay? And he does this um, way before the Harvard Business School caught on to management approaches. Jesus knew, okay? No, or our VBS kids here. Yes, yeah. If you, if you do a sport, okay, or you've been in a play, okay, one of the things that, that your coach or your director will do is, is they'll tell you, hey, that was a great job. You did this really well. Okay? But you know what? You need to work on this part here. Okay? Maybe you delivered a line really well, but the next line you kind of mumbled. Okay? Or you, you, you know, swing in the bath. They said, yeah, you're doing great here, but you've got to keep your eye on the ball. Right? Jesus does the same thing. Okay? With each church, he gives an affirmation. He says to that church, you're doing this really well. Good job. And then he goes, but <laughs> you got something to work on too. Okay. Because that is true for all of us. It's true for us as individuals. It's true for us as congregations. It's true for us as denominations. It's true for the church. Okay. So Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, he affirms them. And he says, I know your deeds. I know your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but aren't. Okay? Good job. You guys are doing really well on these things. Keep it up. Okay? You're doing well. Okay? He says that same kind of thing to these other churches that we read in these two chapters. Okay? To the, uh, the church in Pergamum, he says, yeah, you're remaining true to my name, even though you're in the midst of a culture that is really pulling against you. You haven't, you've not renounced your faith. Good job. Okay. In other places, he says, uh, you know, I, I know your deeds, I know your love, your, your service, and your perseverance. Okay. I know that you're doing more now than, than you did before. Okay. Each church has, has some strengths, has some things that they're doing well. And one of the things that we're called on to do as churches, whether this congregation or another congregation, we're, t we're called to examine that and to look and see how, how are we doing okay? and recognize that there's some things we're doing well. Okay? Talked about the uh, collecting food for manna. Okay? We're collecting these, these uh, grocery bags full of picnic food that we're going to take down to the food bank okay? and it's going to go out to people who, who are hungry and, and you know, maybe they don't have as much variety and we're going to say, hey, let's, let's celebrate together. We're going we're to help people to do that. Okay. Yeah. There are things that we do well as a church. Okay. And we need to focus on those things. Okay. Sometimes it's really easy to get distracted by the things that aren't so good. Okay. And that's why Jesus starts with affirmations. Okay. He starts and says, don't forget, things are, things are good. You're doing all right. But, he says, I hold this against you. Okay. He says to the, the church in Ephesus, you're doing a great job, yet, yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Okay. He says, remember what it was about when we started here? <laughs> he said, it was about me. Jesus is saying, it's about me. That what you do, you're doing because you love me. You may be doing a great job of, of going out there and, and you know, feeding people or building houses or uh, you know, tutoring kids in school. Yeah, that's all good, well and good, he says, but don't forget why you're doing it. Don't forget your first love. Okay. You may be really, really socially active and, and calling out injustice and making sure that things are where they're supposed to be in the world. And he says, you know, that, that's good, but don't forget why you're doing it. He's saying where we need to start is being in him, right? loving Jesus. Right? And that's what he says to the church in, in Ephesus, but he says different things to the different churches. Right? He reminds the, the church in, in Smyrna. Right? He tells them that, um, well, he tells them a bunch of things, actually. Oh. 
Um, he tells them that he, he knows the, the difficulties they're putting up with. Okay? He goes on to Pergamum and says that, you know, you guys are, are staying true, but, but you know, you're eating food sacrificed to idols. In other words, you're, you're just accommodating the culture around you, okay? and you're committing sexual immorality. Okay? He says to the church in, in Thier, uh, Thyatira, you're, you're accepting teaching that is not, not true. Okay? You're letting this, this person teach you things that aren't in accord with what I taught you. He says to the, uh, the church in, in Sardis, okay, you, you start on things and you haven't finished. Okay? You've got these un, unfinished work and you, you can't do that. You've got to follow through. Okay? Over and over, he gives us things where he says, this is good, but you've got to work on this. Okay? And every church and every member of the church, okay, we need to do that too. We need to look at those things we're doing well, and then we need to look at those things and say, well, what does Jesus have to say about this? Okay. You know, we're, we're bringing food out to, to people at Thanksgiving and at, and at Christmas. We have these gifts we're bringing to families. Okay. He says, but, but are you forming relationships with them? Okay. Are you showing them my love 365 days of the year or just twice a year? Is this really, is this what I fully call you to do or are you just doing a part? Okay. You've got all these, all these wonderful resources that you're using, but, but am I the center of it? Okay. He says you, you are giving money to support the young life. You're, you're supporting all these wonderful causes. He says, but is that an add-on? Is that like you know, value added to your life that you're doing this? Or is that, is that the center? Is Jesus what it's all about? For all of us and for all our churches, Jesus says, you're doing this well, but you got to work on this. Okay. And then he goes on and he motivates us. Okay. Just like you know, if, you're, if you're being coached okay, and, you're, and your coach tells you, you know, oh, you're, you're doing, doing this well, but you got to work on your swing because if you do this, you're going to have a great game. Okay. Or you're out, trying out for the play and it's like you're, you're saying this this line well, but really you need to stand differently when you deliver this line. And, and if you do, you know, the audience is going to love it. Okay. Well, Jesus says, there's things you're doing well and there's things you need to work on. And if you do, okay, eternal life is there for you. Okay. Not just long life somewhere in the future, okay, but a life suited to eternity. And just like he gave little pieces to each church, of who he is. He gives little pieces of what's in store for us to each church. Yeah. He says to the church in Ephesus that, that if, you, uh, if you persevere, if you're victorious, he says, I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life. And to the church in Smyrna, that, that if the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Yeah. To the church in Pergamum, he says that if you're victorious, I'm going to give you of the hidden manna. I'm going to provide all your needs. Yeah. And that that person's going to get a, a white stone with a new name written on it. Okay? That you're going to be a new creation. Okay? Somebody, somebody bright and new like a bright white stone. He goes through and he describes what's ahead for us. He says, it is worth it. Okay? It is worth it to examine where you are and where you're going, what you're doing well and what you're doing poor. Okay? And to strive to be the church that God calls us to be. He says, it is worth it. Let me tell you about it. Okay. Jesus is, is trying to help us to grow into the disciples that he calls us to be. Okay. And he does that uh, with, with this sense that we're going to be victorious. Okay. Do you notice what, was, what he said to Peter? Okay. You know, all the times, I don't know, how many of you have worried about the state of the church in America? Okay. Anybody out there, right? <laughs> you make you a little anxious. It's like, you know, oh, where, you know, where are the, the new churches? Where are the kids? Where are the youth? What about those millennials, right? And we get all anxious and we forget what Jesus promised. Okay? Jesus said okay, that not even the gates of hell can prevail against my church. See, it's okay. Jesus says, I've got this. Even to these churches here, he's saying the same thing. It's fascinating. These seven churches, guess how old they were? Okay. They weren't celebrating their 150th year. Okay. 
maybe their 30th, right? These were young churches. They'd just gotten going, right? And already they were off the rails, right? Already they had all these things they were, they were messing up on, right? It's that reminder that the church is one generation away from oblivion. That's it, right? One generation, we're done, right? Who's going to come in next? They're, they're gone, right? We have that, that responsibility to see that the faith is passed on, to be doing vacation Bible school, to be talking to our kids at home, to be talking to our grandkids, to be sharing the faith so that it is carried on. We're just one generation away from oblivion. But you know what? We're just one generation away from revival. We're on the verge of of just catching fire, of the Spirit blowing through and, and just fanning the flame so that the church, this congregation, other congregations, the church in America becomes this vibrant, authentic, kingdom-forming body eh, that does all those things that we we hope the church will do. eh? And Jesus is just waiting for us. eh? And that's why this uh, message to the churches that he's writing here ends with this passage about, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. How many of you, when you hear that, you picture that, that picture of Jesus at the cottage, it's that kind of round door, and he's, he's knocking with a lamp. And, and this is always presented as though this is uh, about evangelism. That, hey, you heathens out there, Jesus is standing at the door. He's knocking. You better open up. Okay? He's not writing to them. He's writing to us. He's saying to us, to the church, I stand at the door and knock. Okay? I'm ready to get something new going. I'm knocking on the door. Are you going to open? Are you going to open the door and let me come in? Remember your first love and be the church I call you to be. We're just a generation away from oblivion, but we are right on the verge of revival. Jesus stands at the door and he is knocking. He's waiting for us to open it. That is the vision that that John gives us of what it means to be church. That is a vision that we are invited to catch. That vision that encourages us to open the door, let him in, and start it all over again. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.